Hi, and welcome to the Corporate Finance Institute. My name is Tim Vipond, and I'll be your instructor for Corporate Finance 101, our introductory course to corporate finance. We're going to cover a lot of topics in this course. Once I'm done with the introduction, we'll dive into the capital markets and talk about who the major players are, as well as outline some of the job opportunities within those players. We'll next move on to talk about business valuation, different ways of determining a company's worth. We'll go over mergers and acquisitions, and then move on to capital raising, both debt financing and equity financing. Finally, we'll really focus in on careers and talk about the various opportunities that are available for you in corporate finance. My name is Tim Vipond, and I'm the CEO of the Corporate Finance Institute. I have a broad background in corporate finance. Started my career in investment banking at CIBC World Markets in Canada, where I worked on several mergers and acquisitions, as well as capital raising. From there, I worked in investment management, dealing with high net worth individuals and managing portfolios. I later went on after doing my MBA to work at Gold Corp, the largest gold mining company in the world at the time, in their strategy and corporate development groups, where again I was involved with numerous mergers and acquisitions, as well as some divestitures. Finally, I headed up the corporate finance group of Shoes.com, a private company that did several mergers and acquisitions and raised a lot of money in the private markets. So I think that I can draw on the experience that I've got both on the advisory side in investment banking, plus the in-house experience at a public company like Goldcorp and a private company like Shoes.com to give you a very well-rounded overview of corporate finance careers. By the end of this course, I hope you'll have a good understanding of what the options are for you out there, what additional coursework might be helpful for you to get your skills up to the level you need them to be, and hopefully be ready to go to start your career in corporate finance. Session Objectives I'm going to outline the session objectives for this course. The first is the capital markets. We need to understand who the players are and what they do. From there, we can talk about business valuation and the various approaches to determining the value of a company. We'll go into mergers and acquisitions, the primary function of investment bankers and corporate development professionals. And then we'll go on to equity financing, as well as debt financing, the two major sources of funding in corporate finance careers. So on the capital markets section, we're going to dive into M&A advisory and underwriting, the two major components of investment banking, and talk about how those relate to the funding life cycle for a corporation. When we talk about business valuation, we're going to describe the difference between equity values and enterprise values. It's important to always distinguish between the two. We're then going to talk about DCF analysis and that will lead into financial modeling. On the mergers and acquisition side, we want to understand the process, what a transaction looks like from a timeline perspective, talk about things like synergies and valuation. And finally, we'll talk about how to finance a transaction, which will be a great segue into our equity financing section. We'll talk about the various types of equity financing that are available, both publicly and private. And finally, debt financing. It's important to understand the different types of debt financing that are available and how they impact returns and risk in a transaction. My hope is that by the end of this course, after going through each of these sections, you'll have a very solid understanding of what corporate finance is really all about, what the different career paths are, the types of personality that fit those career paths, the types of skill sets that are required to get jobs in those various areas, and then how to actually go out and get those jobs. That's our primary objective with this course, to help you advance your career in corporate finance. Capital Markets we're going to outline who the players are in corporate finance, in the capital markets particularly. On the one side of this diagram, we're going to start with corporates. Corporates are operating businesses. They run manufacturing companies, service companies, technology companies, and they require capital to grow and run their operations. 
On the other side, we have institutions. These consist of fund managers. They could be institutional investors, but also retail investors as well. These are the people that have capital. So the capital flows from the institutions or investment managers who have the money to the corporations that need that money to grow and run their business. In exchange, the corporations issue back to the investors bonds, which is debt, or shares, which are equity. And this completes the cycle between the two. Now, in the middle of these two groups sit the investment banks. They're often referred to as the sell side, and they have contacts on both sides of this diagram. They have corporate clients, and they have institutional investor clients. Their job is to match up the institutional investors with the corporates based on risk and return expectations and investment style to get a deal done. In addition, you have public accounting firms, which will be the fourth category that we talk about in our course. So to review, the four players in corporate finance from our perspective are number one, the corporates, number two, the institutions, number three, the investment banks, and number four, the public accounting firms. This is an example of how the primary markets work. Let's move on now to talk about the secondary market. In the secondary market, after securities have already been issued, they trade between investors. So on one side, you have a fund manager who wants to buy securities of a public company. On the other side, you have a different fund manager somewhere else in the world, perhaps, who wants to sell those same securities. That trade is facilitated over a stock exchange, but investment bankers get between these clients to help facilitate the trade. So once again, the investment banks facilitate sales and trading and provide equity research coverage to help the fund managers make decisions about buying and selling those securities. This is how the secondary market works. So to recap, in the primary markets, we have banks, corporates, fund managers, and accounting firms all facilitating the issuance of securities. And then in the secondary markets here, we have fund managers and banks working together to trade in a secondary market. This is what makes markets liquid. This is what allows you to get in and out of a security very easily, is this secondary market trading. Let's talk about the business life cycle. On this graph, across the horizontal axis, I've got time in years, and on the vertical axis, dollars, which will represent various financial metrics. Each company begins with a launch, and then grows the business during its rapidly expanding phase. There may be a shakeout amongst competition, and from there it re reaches maturity, and finally a state of decline. This is the classic business life cycle. Now, at various stages of this life cycle, financial metrics look very different. The first one we're going to review is sales or revenue. At launch, of course, it's zero. It grows very rapidly during the growth phase. Shakeout is when competition enters and there's, as you can see, sort of a peak to the sales growth as competition becomes fierce and the uh, industry becomes mature and eventually declines. Now, following sales or revenue, you have profit. Profit can often be negative in the early days of a business, shortly following launch, as you see it dipping negative in this graph, sort of breaking even at the growth phase, and then just slowly growing and perhaps even declining during maturity. Now, it's important to notice that this profit cycle lags the sales cycle. So there's a time delay between the sales growth and the profit growth. This is important for when we talk about funding. And the third part of the cycle is cash flow, the actual cash of the business. And cash even lags profit. So when you think about all of the upfront costs of starting a business, 
Many of them may be capitalized and not reflected in profit, but certainly impact cash flow. So you can see cash dipping even more negative than profit in the early phases, but then rising to be higher than profit in the later phases when capital spending is largely behind the business and therefore cash generation is higher than profit on the income statement. This is also important when we talk about funding a business. I should note that many businesses do experience a life cycle extension by reinventing themselves, reinvesting in technology, and may continue to repeat this cycle over and over. Now let's move on to the funding life cycle. In the funding life cycle, we have the same stages of a company along the horizontal axis. Across the vertical axis, we have the level of risk in the business, the level of risk from either lending money to the business or from providing capital to the business. So as a refresher, we have the sales cycle, but inverse to the sales cycle is the business risk cycle. So at launch, when sales are lowest, risk of the business is highest. Then over time, as sales are proven out and the business grows, the level of risk declines. This is fairly intuitive. But inverse to the risk business is the funding cycle. So at launch, it's basically impossible to get debt financing for an unproven business with no track record. And over time, that ability to get debt funding increases with the most mature, stable businesses having the highest access to debt capital and the early stage, newly launched businesses having the lowest access to debt capital. In corporate finance, there are two main functions. The first is M&A advisory and the second is capital raising. In this section, we're going to focus on capital raising or underwriting from the banker's perspective. So on the M&A side, there's negotiation, structuring and valuation associated with a deal. And this could be on the advisory side as an investment bank or a transaction advisor or in house in corporate development. And similarly on the capital raising side, this includes IPOs or follow on offerings. But jobs exist on the sell side with the investment banks providing advisory services and also on the corporate side with corporate development groups being very involved in these processes. And then finally, at the accounting firms providing support services for these types of transactions. There are three main components of advisory services. The first is the planning phase. Second is assessing timing and demand for the issue. And third is the issue structure. So in the planning phase, it's important to identify the themes, understand the rationale for the investment, get a preliminary view of investor demand or interest in this type of an offering. On the timing or demand side, it's time to think about what are the market conditions like right now? Is it a hot or cold market? What is the investor appetite or risk level in the market right now and investor experience? And finally, when we get into structuring, is it going to be domestic or international? Is it going to be retail or institutional? And it's time to start thinking about actually selling the deal. There are three types of underwriting commitments or offerings. The first is a firm commitment. Second is a best efforts. And third is all or none. In a firm commitment, the underwriter buys the entire issue and is responsible for any unsold shares. A best efforts basis is the most common, which is a marketed deal where the underwriter agrees to issue the securities but does not make any promise about how that deal will be performing or how much of it is sold. And finally, all or none. In an all or none transaction, the entire issue has to be sold or the whole deal is pulled. So in summary, there are three main stages of the underwriting or capital raising process and three types of underwriting commitments, firm commitments, best efforts or marketed, and finally all or none. A best effort or marketed deal is the most common.
Let's talk about the mechanics of the capital raising or underwriting process. The book building process starts with a prospectus price range where there's a range of prices that investment bankers expect investors to be interested in. From there, the price can be narrowed to an institutional investor commitment at a more firm price. This is how the book of demand is built. So orders come in at certain prices from institutional investors and the bankers then have this list of orders or book of demand as they call it that they build and to justify the pricing. And then finally a price is set to ensure clearing based on the book of orders. So the investment bankers can look at all the orders that have come in from institutional investors and decide what the clearing price will be so the issue is fully closed. Finally, the orders are allocated. Some investors might not get all of the orders that they wanted. If the book is called oversubscribed, then some may get less than they asked for. The roadshow process. So the roadshow is an often talked about part of capital raising. And this is when management literally goes on the road with the investment bankers and goes to meet the institutional investors that are going to be buying this investment. There are a few areas that are critical to a successful roadshow. The first is understanding management structure and governance. Investors are adamant that management structure and governments must be conducive to creating good returns. Additionally, the investors will want to know the key risks of the business. Although not positive, it is important to highlight the risks and be upfront about them. The next is strategy, both tactical and long term. What are the strategic initiatives of this business? How is it going to create sustainable value over the long run? Who are the main competitors? Again, not a positive, but something that needs to be highlighted and, if spun in the right way, can demonstrate a leg up over the competition. It's always important to outline the, what the funding purpose is. What is the cash going to be used for after it's raised? Investors like to see a good use of proceeds. And finally, there needs to be a thorough analysis of the industry or sector looking at trends in the industry, not just for this company that's raising the money, but for the industry as a whole. Let's move on to talk about some of the key issues in pricing and offering. One is price stability. After the offering is completed, investors do not want a lot of volatility, so price stability is very important. A buoyant aftermarket. If there is going to be volatility, it should hopefully be to the upside with a strong market and certainly not to the downside. A deep investor base will help achieve this. Having a large number of investors in an issue as opposed to just one or two highly concentrated investors will help stabilize and make a deep aftermarket. And finally, access to the market is always going to be critical. So in pricing the issue, there are a couple of trade-offs. There's tension in the choices. The first is having strong aftermarket price performance on one side. But on the other side, not underpricing too much so that money is left on the table. So you want to price it just low enough that there's good aftermarket performance but not so low that the issuer is feeling that they've left money on the table. Let's talk about costs associated with the flotation. One is reducing the risk of an equity overhang, and the other is ensuring a buoyant aftermarket. But there's a temptation from the bank to underprice the issue. Why? Because they want to get the deal done and because they want to reduce the chance of being caught with an equity overhang, which is another way of saying unsold equity at the end of the deal. So 
reducing the risk of an equity overhang helps ensure a buoyant aftermarket but it doesn't necessarily get the best returns for the current owners which is to say the highest price of the issue so there is a lot of complexity around pricing an issue of getting the issue to sell but also not pricing it too low and and having the right balance so if we review the ipo pricing process we start by determining the full value of a business this is done by a combination of discounted cash flow analysis comparable company analysis precedent transactions etc and we have other courses on valuation techniques if you want to do a deep dive into financial modeling or business valuation please check out our various courses on financial modeling and business valuation so you get the full value of a business by these methods from there you deduct an IPO discount so we come in a little bit lower than the intrinsic value or full value of the business to price the offering after deducting the IPO discount we arrive at the pricing range a minimum and maximum price that we believe institutional investors will fill this issue at typically 10 to 15 percent is a normal range for the indicative minimum and maximum prices finally at the end of the day the issue will be priced typically within the range but it may be priced outside the range in the case of a very heavily oversubscribed offering or it may be repriced below the range if demand is lower than expected at the end of the day it's ultimately up to the institutional investors to determine the price of the offering business valuation in this session we're going to talk about several forms of business valuation these are the most common methods used to value a business and is very applicable for anyone considering a career in investment banking equity research private equity corporate development and any other aspect of corporate finance that involves valuation the first objective of this session is to describe how to value a business using a multiple a valuation multiple compares the value of a business relative to some financial metric some typically something on the income statement like revenue or EBITDA but it could also be on the cash flow statement like cash flow as well so we will talk about the different types of valuation multiples and how to use those to value a business this valuation method is a relative form of valuation in that we're comparing our business to another business the second objective is to understand how to value a business on its own using a discounted cash flow analysis a DCF analysis does not take into account what other businesses are valued at and looks only at the future of this business and what cash flow it's going to produce in the future understanding these two methods is critical for a wide range of careers in corporate finance let's talk about how to value a business for an acquisition there are three main valuation techniques that are used across corporate finance whether you're working in investment banking equity research private equity you name it you're going to be looking at these three main methods of valuation the first method is public company comparable analysis or comps for short this involves looking at public companies that are similar businesses in similar industries and seeing at what they're valued at in the market. We then compare those valuations to the business that we want to apply a value to. The second approach is precedent transactions. This involves looking at past M&A transactions. We look at what other companies paid for businesses as an outright acquisition. Just as with public company comparables, we also want precedent transactions to be similar types of businesses and in similar industries to what we're trying to value. These two categories make up the relative valuation section of that business valuation. The third category is discounted cash flow analysis or DCF. DCF analysis looks at the intrinsic value of the business. 
It is not relative to any other business and looks solely at the business on its own. So as I mentioned, the first two public company comparables and precedent transactions are a form of relative valuation. They typically look at equity multiples and enterprise value multiples. In the next section, we'll talk about the difference between those two. On the DCF side, we've got the standalone valuation for the business, looking only internally or intrinsically at the value of the business. However, if it's being used to value a business for acquisition, as in this case, we may also factor in synergies, which are cost savings that we could expect to achieve as a result of integrating this business with ours. So taken in combination with a standalone value, the synergies typically add significant value over and above the standalone and indicate how much we might be able to pay for this business. So for anyone who's looking for a career in corporate finance, whether it's on the advisory side at an investment bank or at a public accounting firm, you're going to have to be very familiar with these three types of valuation. If you want to go on the corporate side of things and work in-house in, say, corporate development or FP&A, again, you're going to have to be familiar with these types of valuation methods as they'll be useful for you inside the company as well. Now, just to review one final time, and to really make it clear, if you ever get this question in an interview, or if you're ever asked about valuation in the context of corporate finance, there are three methods of valuation. First is comps, comparable company analysis. Two, precedents, past M&A transactions. And three, DCF, or discounted cash flow analysis. This summarizes the main forms of valuation that you'll encounter in corporate finance. Enterprise value versus equity value. In this short chapter, I'm going to outline the difference between the enterprise value of a business and the equity value of a business. Simply put, the enterprise value is the entire value of the business without giving consideration to its capital structure. It consists of both the equity value and the net debt of the business. So the equity value is calculated by taking the enterprise value and deducting the debt and adding the cash. The enterprise value is calculated by taking the equity value, subtracting the cash and adding the debt. The simplest example of this that I can give is with a house. If you were to describe to someone your home and the value of your home, you would be talking about the enterprise value of that house. You would say, my home is worth a million dollars. That's the enterprise value. Now let's suppose you have a $500,000 mortgage on the home, and therefore you have $500,000 of equity. That's the other side of this diagram. It would be very unusual to walk up to someone and tell them that the value of your home is $500,000 of equity. People don't typically care about the size of your mortgage versus the equity. They just want to know what the whole home is worth. That's why in business valuation, we typically talk about enterprise value more commonly as it strips out the capital structure and just looks at the value of the whole business. So on the enterprise value side of this equation, we compare the enterprise value to things like revenue or sales, EBITDA, and EBIT. Notice that these three metrics are all before interest on the income statement. That's because this does not give consideration to any debt on the balance sheet. So these items must be before interest on the income statement. On the other side of this equation, we have equity value metrics like price to earnings, price to book value, and price to cash flow. Notice that these three metrics are all after interest. So earnings, book value, which is an equity value metric, and then cash flow, earnings and cash flow are both after interest expense, and therefore the remaining value is available to equity holders. Hopefully this gives you a clear understanding of the difference between enterprise value and equity value, and it's important to always know the difference between the two and which one we're talking about. Unlocking the drivers of value. In this section, we're going to talk about what drives value of a business, how to increase it, or what destroys value. 
We can start by looking at the formula for the net present value of a business. The present value of a business is equal to the free cash flow times 1 plus the growth rate divided by the cost of capital minus that growth rate. So the free cash flow is the free cash flow generated by the business in this terminal year. The growth rate is the perpetual growth rate that we expect the business to grow at forever, if that were theoretically possible. And the cost of capital is the opportunity cost of investing in the firm, or as another way to put it is the rate of return that's demanded by investors for this firm given its level of risk. So let's break apart this formula and look at the driver's evaluation. On the free cash flow part of this, we have things like business strategy, sales, marketing, cost structure, competitive advantage, business model. These things all drive cash flow of the business. To the extent we can increase sales and decrease costs, we improve the free cash flow. As free cash flow goes up, the net present value of the business goes up. On the next part of the numerator, we have the growth rate. What is the organic sustainable growth rate of this business? When will it reach maturity or has it already reached maturity? To the extent the business can increase this perpetual growth rate, it creates value for the company and increases its present value. On the denominator, we've got the cost of capital. The cost of capital is dependent on the risk of the business and macroeconomic factors. So as a company is able to become lower risk, either by having more stable cash flow or more stable price returns, it has a lower discount rate and therefore it increases the present value of that business. The other thing that can impact this is macroeconomic factors. Cost of capital is essentially a spread. It's, it's a risk spread relative to the risk-free rate. So as the risk-free rate goes up, the value of a business goes down because it's a higher discount rate. As we're in a very, very low interest rate environment, that creates higher asset prices. So the economic impact of the Fed lowering rates causes asset prices to rise, as you can see in this equation. And then again, we've got the growth rate on the denominator as well. So the same impacts as described above would also apply to the growth rate on the denominator. Let's look at the drivers of value and price in a little more detail. Intrinsic value is driven by things like EBITDA, expected growth, capital requirements of the business, and the company's cost of capital, as we discussed in the previous section. But we also have to consider, in corporate finance, and particularly with acquisitions, the transaction structure. It's not just the intrinsic value of the business that matters, but also how the deal is structured. What's the form of consideration? Is it cash or shares? Um, all of these factors listed here will play in to the value versus price equation of an acquisition. And in this third category, we've got synergies and strategic value. One thing may be the intrinsic value of the business or the structure, but another is what is the strategic value of this business to us? Does it give us diversification or entry into a new market? Maybe it's human talent that we're after, like management and employees, things that are a little harder to value in a financial model. All of these play in to the value versus price equation. And the value versus price equation also has to consider things like deal costs and process, negotiation, structuring, legal, etc. So at the end of the day, when looking at an acquisition, all four of these categories are having an impact. We've got external factors like the industry and what's happening there, and then internal factors like what's happening at the company. At the end of the day, all four converge, all four push inward to create the price, the price that we're willing to pay, the price that creates value for us, and ultimately the price that we want to move forward with this transaction at. In this section, we're going to look at discounted cash flow analysis in more detail. By analyzing the formula, we can understand what drives the discounted cash flow analysis and how to build it in Excel. For more detail on this, I suggest taking our financial modeling courses. 
Specifically, our Fundamentals of Financial Modeling and Building a Financial Model in Excel course outline in great detail how to build a DCF model from scratch. If we look at an example of a cash flow that occurs in 2018, we have a discount factor and the formula for the discount factor is 1 over 1 plus the rate, which is in this case 10%, to the power of the number of periods, in this case one. The second cash flow, which occurs in 2019, is also $100, but this time is raised to the power of two. As you can see at the bottom here, the present value of that number, of the 100, is being reduced over time. In 2020, it's raised to the power of three and becomes only $75 of present value today, from $100 of free cash flow in the future. By 2021, it's worth $68 today. 2022, it's down to 62. And then finally, in a DCF analysis, we have a terminal value. So the first five years were our forecast, a detailed forecast of what we expect cash flow to be over five years. And then we value the business into perpetuity using a terminal value. In this case, we're saying the terminal value of the business is $300 in future cash flow. But raised uh, to the power of five, that's only worth $186 today. So as you can see, the discounted cash flow amount becomes quite big at the end, but the present value is significantly less. So to calculate the entire value of this firm, which is 565, we add up these cash flows in their present value. So $565 million of present value compared to $800 million of future value. Now let's take a look at the cost of capital formula. The cost of capital depends on the capital structure of a business and its level of risk. So a company consists of assets. That's the base of the business, but then it has a capital structure that make up those assets consisting of debt and equity. So we have to take into consideration the percentage of the company's capital that's debt and the percentage that's equity. We multiply each of those by their respective costs and we arrive at the contribution to the cost of capital of each. So to sum them up gives us the total cost of capital. Now let's use a real example with some numbers. Take a company with the following capital structure. Debt is on the top, equity is on the bottom. The proportionate weightings are 14% debt, 86% equity. The cost of debt after tax is 3.5%. The cost of equity is 9%. This company has a weighted average cost of capital of 8.2%. This number is the number that plugs in to the formula we were using on the previous section where we were calculating the present value of a business. So in this case, instead of being 1.1 as in the previous example, it would be 1.082 raised to the power of whatever year or period we're discounting from. Sometimes these concepts can be tricky to grasp on the first pass. I highly recommend looking at our other courses that touch on cost of capital and financial modeling to get more detailed explanations of these concepts. Mergers and acquisitions. In this session, we've got several objectives. The first is to outline the steps of an acquisition process. What does it look like from start to finish? The second is talk about the different types of buyers. There are strategic buyers and financial buyers. Thirdly, identify synergies, both soft synergies and hard synergies. We'll talk about value of financial synergies as well, a separate category. And finally, outline transaction costs and their impact on M&A transactions. Ten step acquisition checklist. In this chapter, we're going to review a ten step process to ensuring that an acquisition is properly integrated from the beginning to the end.
The first step is to have an acquisition strategy, an actual plan around acquisitions and why they benefit your business. You need to have some criteria. So the strategy tells you why you're acquiring businesses, but the criteria tells you specifically what types of businesses to acquire. Once you have one and two in place, you can start step number three, which is searching for a target. You actually build a target list and go about finding these companies and reaching out to them. There should be a planning process once you've started searching and speaking with these companies to actually plan for this acquisition strategy. Once your planning process has gotten to the point where you're actually talking to targets and have received financial information from them, you can start valuing and evaluating those opportunities. This is where you get into some real detail of financial modeling and valuation. After you've done your valuation and modeling of the business, you can start negotiating with the seller, trying to get the best price and make the acquisition as accretive to you as possible. Once negotiations are more or less complete and a price is agreed on, then a due diligence process begins. This involves confirming that the company's financials are as you expected them to be and that there are no hidden problems with the business. Finally, you enter into a purchase and sale contract once confirmatory due diligence is complete. Then financing can be put in place. In most cases, there will be some level of debt involved in the acquisition, but also preparing to issue shares if necessary or to transfer the cash if it's a cash deal and the cash is on the balance sheet. And finally, integration or implementation. And in fact, number 10 opens up a new staircase. The integration staircase can be very long and very arduous. In fact, a lot of companies are probably over optimistic about their ability to integrate businesses with their own. And what they thought were synergies may in the short term turn out to actually be increased costs and hopefully over time get brought down and managed to really achieve the synergies that were hoped for. So this 10 step process should give you a pretty good idea of what it's like to work on mergers and acquisitions. If you're working in investment banking, you'll be involved in various parts of this process, most heavily around valuation, negotiation, and um, actual closing of the deal. If you work in-house in corporate development for a company, you'll be involved in all 10 of these steps. So this is very important for most careers in corporate finance that touch on M&A. Strategic versus financial buyers. In this section, we're going to talk about the two types of buyers in M&A transactions. Strategic buyers, which are competitors or operating companies, and then financial buyers, which are private equity firms or financial sponsors. So strategic buyers are typically after either horizontal or vertical expansion. Horizontal being gaining more market share in the same space, and vertical being integrating down the supply chain. Strategic buyers need to identify and deliver operating synergies. This is how they create value, not just by paying dollar for dollar what another business is worth, but by reducing operating costs, creating strategic value, and ultimately making a business that's worth more than just A plus B. Synergies fall into two categories, hard synergies, which are cost savings, or soft synergies, which are increases in revenue or benefits of being of bigger size and gaining market share cross-selling examples like this. On the financial buyer side, you've got private equity firms. Private equity firms have a different strategy. They're not looking for synergies. They're looking to use leverage to get maximum equity returns. So they want to borrow as much money as they can and use that to increase the equity returns. Let's talk about rivalry among bidders. Whether it's a strategic buyer, or a financial sponsor. In both cases, there can be very competitive processes. Companies normally have to pay some type of a premium for the business. This takeover premium or control premium is observed very frequently and a lot of it is due to the competitive nature of M&A. Companies normally have to outbid other buyers. 
a formal process is typically run for the selling company and investment bankers will work to scour the planet for anyone they can find who could put in a bid for this business and get the highest possible price. So in order to have the highest bid, you either need to be able to have the ability to achieve synergies or have access to cheap financing that will allow you to lever it up and ultimately get the best returns. So let's look at an example of how financial sponsors or private equity firms use leverage to enhance their returns. Let's take a company, ABC Co., that has assets of $100. It has net income of $10, and therefore, based on its capital structure, which is $50 of debt and $50 of equity, it has a return on equity of 20%. This is how the business currently exists today. Now, on the right side of this page, let's assume that we change the capital structure to be $80 of debt and 20 of equity. As a result, what's happened is the net income has gone from 10 to 8 because of the interest expense. But the return on equity has gone from 20% to 40%. $8 of net income divided by $20 of equity is much higher than $10 of net income divided by $50 of equity. This is how private equity firms and financial sponsors achieve their high rates of return. Let's talk about the acquisition valuation process. The first step is to value the target as a standalone business. The second step is to value the synergies that we believe can be achieved. So in the first step, we're going to be looking at the enterprise value of the business. We're going to look at the sales growth, the margins, the tax environment, the working capital structure, and the actual capital structure that we intend to put on this business. In phase two, when we're looking at synergies, we focus more on things like overhead reductions, efficiencies, and being fully invested in the business. Now let's take a look at what was described on the previous slides in a seven step process. So the first step as an analyst or someone who's involved in an M&A transaction and building the financial model is to value the business as a standalone entity. And for more on financial modeling, you can check our numerous financial modeling courses that will walk you through extreme detail of how to build a financial model from scratch. Once you've built the model, you're then going to look at the hard synergies, the cost savings that can be achieved. And you'll also look at the soft savings, which are the revenue increases or market expansion that can also be achieved. Those two things add value to the standalone value of the business. Finally, financial synergies that can be achieved by levering up the business or accessing cheaper debt, perhaps, again, add value and should be modeled. But then deducted from that are the transaction costs. So the investment banking fees, legal fees, etc., all have to be netted out and actually are reducing value of the transaction. So in step six, we see the net value of the synergies and the standalone value of the business. Those two combined are the total value of this opportunity. But next to that, we have our consideration, which is our purchase price. To the extent we can offer consideration that's less than the value in column 6, we've created value for ourselves, as indicated at the top of column 7. We want this square to be as big as possible when we're looking at an M&A transaction. There are a variety of issues to consider when structuring a deal. I'm going to start from the outside of this diagram and work my way into the center, which is the heart of the deal. So on the outside of this, we've got all sorts of things influencing us, like accounting and taxes, the other bidders, legal and corporate structures, as well as antitrust considerations if there's competition involved, and contracts in place. And all of these items together make up the transaction environment. All of these different issues are impacting our decisions and influencing us in the process. Then, within the transaction environment or below that level, 
We've got market conditions and our business plan. These are all influencing us at a closer level as we get to the structuring phase. In the structuring phase, we have to give careful consideration to all of these issues. And then finally, at the center of it all, we have the actual deal that transpires. So there are many layers of circles involved in M&A transactions and many considerations that have to be given thought to when structuring a deal. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list of considerations, but simply to make you aware that there are many layers of things to think about when structuring a deal. Financing for mergers, acquisitions, and management buyouts. Let's take a look at the capital stack. The capital stack represents the tiers of financing that are used to complete an acquisition. At the top of the stack, we have senior debt. Senior debt ranks in first priority to be paid out in a liquidity event. It's the most secure and also has the lowest rate of return. Private equity firms that are doing a leverage buyout will try to put as much senior debt in place as possible to enhance their equity returns. After maximizing the senior debt, they'll then move on to subordinated debt. As the name implies, this ranks junior to the senior debt. It's higher risk and pays a higher interest rate. Following the subordinated debt is the equity piece. The equity piece is the actual check that the investor has to write to buy the business. So in combination here, we have the full capital stack, the amount of senior debt, subordinated debt, and equity that's used to complete the transaction. As you'll see on the next slide, there can be various components of each of these types of financing. We'll walk through some high-level overview of each of them. This is a really great chart that illustrates the profile of various types of debt. So across the horizontal axis, we have the time to maturity. Across the vertical axis, we have the dollar value of the debt outstanding. So let's look at the first type of debt, senior debt, the first tranche. This is often equal amortizing debt. For example, it may pay back over three years in equal installments over the three years. As you can see by the declining line over time, the principal amount is being reduced over those three years at a steady pace. Next, after the senior debt, we may have tranche B, another piece of senior debt, with what's called a balloon payment. This debt amortizes more slowly than the senior debt and then has a balloon payment that comes after the senior debt is fully paid off. This gives the business a buffer to repay this, the tranche B after tranche A is repaid. Next in line would be an example of mezzanine financing or high yield debt that's non-amortizing. As you can see by the horizontal line across the top, the principal is not being repaid at all until one final bullet repayment at the end. And notice again how this bullet payment occurs after the balloon for tranche B, which is after the final payment for tranche A. And next we have payment in kind or PIC. A PIC loan has accrued interest that builds and increases the principal amount that's owed over time. So as you can see, this line of principal actually goes up over time. And then finally, there's one very large bullet repayment at the end. And as you can see, this one also has a buffer after the mezzanine finance is repaid and tranche B and tranche A. So you can see how the capital structure can be designed in such a way that the cash flow of the business is able to service each of these types of debt and maximize the leverage that can be used in an acquisition. Debt financing. Session objectives. In this debt financing section, we have three main objectives. The first is to describe to you the different types of debt financing that are available for corporate finance transactions. The second is then to outline the impact of leverage on financial returns, particularly on the internal rate of return and return to equity holders. Finally, we'll look at and explain various types of debt financing structures and options that are available for corporate finance transactions. So you'll have a thorough understanding of how leverage is used in mergers and acquisitions.
Assessing debt capacity. In this section, we're going to look at how much leverage a business can handle. The two main measures are going to be by looking at the balance sheet and looking at cash flow measurements. These two will determine how much debt a business can handle in an M&A transaction. So in order to assess the level of debt capacity, we'll be looking at the EBITDA and not just the level of EBITDA, but the volatility or rather stability of that EBITDA. And that's influenced by several things. It's influenced by industry cyclicality, technology and barriers to entry being the three main measures of stabilizing EBITDA. So cyclical businesses like mining, for example, have a lot less debt capacity than very stable businesses like food businesses. Technology businesses that can be easily disrupted or low barriers to entry, again, have lower debt capacity than, say, long-term infrastructure projects that have very high barriers to entry and are unlikely to be disrupted by technology. So let's take a look at the balance sheet measures that can help us assess the amount of debt a business can handle. The first ratio that we will look at is the debt to equity. This tells us just a high level capital structure overview. Taking the book value of debt to equity, however, can have a few complications from time to time, as things like acquisitions, goodwill, and impairments can all influence the book value of equity compared to the market value of equity. In terms of cash flow metrics, debt to EBITDA is probably the most common. We can break that down further to look at the senior debt to EBITDA ratio or subordinated debt to EBITDA ratios. And we can also look at the cash interest coverage. Cash interest coverage tells us how many times the cash flow that's generated from the business can service the interest expense that's on the debt. Another metric that's getting close to cash flow is taking the EBITDA and deducting capital expenditures. Looking at how many times this metric, EBITDA minus CapEx, covers our interest expense. So at the end of the day, lenders want comfort that the amount of cash flow generated from the business can easily cover the interest expense and ultimately cover the principal repayments that are required as well. Typically lenders will look at a combination of balance sheet measures and cash flow measures when assessing a company's total debt capacity. In this section, we're going to talk about senior debt, but I first want to review the capital stack. As you recall from earlier in this course, we have senior debt at the top, subordinated debt in the middle, and equity below that. This is ranking in terms of priority from top to bottom, and the return profile is the inverse, with equity having the highest return profile and the senior debt the lowest. So let's take a closer look at the senior debt section of the capital stack. There are a few main components of senior debt. Typically companies have a revolving line of credit facility and then they may have various tranches of term loans, A, B, and C in this example. This whole section makes up senior debt. Typically this could rep represent up to 50% of the funding of an acquisition. And that equates to somewhere in the order of two to three times debt to EBITDA. So if you know a company's EBITDA and it's a stable, fairly bankable business, you could assume that perhaps banks would lend two to three times its EBITDA for their senior debt. Or another way to look at it is two times interest coverage. So whatever the interest expense of this debt would be, the company has to generate sufficient cash flow to cover that two times over. The typical providers of senior debt include the commercial banks, credit companies, and insurance companies. Now let's take a look at how senior debt can enhance equity returns. So here's an example of a capital stack, senior debt, subdebt in the middle, and equity at the bottom. Over time, over three to five years, as this business grows, what's going to happen is you're going to see that the equity piece has expanded significantly, the subordinated debt piece is exactly the same, and the senior debt piece is slightly smaller as it's been repaid over its amortization period. So the value of the business has grown 
but the majority of that benefit has gone to equity because senior debt's been paid down and subordinated debt has remained the same. So this is how private equity firms achieve their internal rates of return, and they may be targeting anywhere from 20 to 30% returns. So it's important to ensure that the amount of equity invested up front delivers that adequate internal rate of return, at least for a financial sponsor. And if there is a funding gap to fill, it's often filled with subordinated debt. Senior debt is maxed out, the equity component uh, that's required is put in place, and hopefully subordinated debt fills that gap. This has been a very high level overview of several concepts that are very important in corporate finance. I would suggest that for more detail, you could look at taking our fixed income fundamentals course, which will walk you through bond pricing, yield to maturity calculations, etc. You could also look at our valuation course that covers various valuation techniques and looks at the use of leverage in enhancing returns. And then finally, all of our financial modeling courses will include debt modeling and will look at the use of leverage in calculating internal rates of return and see how this actually plays out by modeling out in Excel. Now let's move down the capital stack into subordinated debt. As you'll see on this slide, there are several types of subordinated debt. And at the top of the stack, we've got the highest uh, security, I'm working our way down to the lowest security. But another way of expressing that is, is with this idea of increasing subordination. So as you move down from high yield bonds to vendor notes, you're becoming increasingly subordinated. But in exchange for that, you're also increasing the expected return. And finally, as you come into some of the lower parts of subordinated debt, like mezzanine debt with warrants or payment in kind notes or vendor notes, you start to increase the dilution to the equity holders. So generally speaking, investors want to have as much of the top of the capital stack as possible as the lower part of the stack starts to increase dilution and eat in at the equity returns. So let's take a closer look at some of these types of subordinated debt. And first, let's also look at how much subordinated debt a company can handle. So a business can only handle so much debt. And typically, the total debt to EBITDA could be up to five to six times. And if you recall from our senior debt presentation, if senior debt is two to three times, you sort of get a sense of how much sub-debt can be added on to that. We also look at EBITDA to cash interest of about two times. And finally, the equity funding piece could be as low as 30 to 35%. Of course, it could be 100%, but at the low end, probably 30% is a safe amount. And the appropriate capital structure has to be constructed with all of these pieces in mind. Debt to EBITDA, cash interest coverage, and a minimum amount of equity funding. Now let's take a closer look at high yield bonds at the top of the subordinated capital stack. It's important to point out that high yield bonds are publicly traded securities. That means they can be traded between investors, whereas mezzanine finance is not tradable. So let's take a look here at high yield bond credit ratings. As you'll see across the top, there are four main rating agencies. The rating agencies provide these credit scores, ranking at the top from the most secure at the bottom to the least. And it's very important here to draw this line in the middle. This line here is the difference between on the top half investment grade and on the bottom half non-investment grade or high yield or also called junk bond sometimes. So at the top, these investment grade are lower risk and therefore lower returns and lower fees, um, um, a much larger and more liquid market. And then on the non-investment grade or high yield or junk bond, you have these higher risk and yet higher return and also higher fee types of bonds. So this is where high yield debt comes in on the bottom half of this table.
Mezzanine debt, however, is non-traded and is also subordinated to the senior debt, like high yield debt. It often has a bullet repayment and cash can be accrued. And there may also be equity warrants attached as well. The equity warrants give the investors exposure to equity upside. It's almost a sweetener on top of the return that they're expected to get on the actual interest payments. So there's debt with warrants or convertible loans that entirely convert into equity or convertible preferred shares. All of these three examples have equity exposure built into the debt security. Now let's take a closer look at the breakdown of mezzanine debt returns. So mezzanine lenders are typically targeting an internal rate of return of 14 to 20 percent. It consists of a few different components. The first is the cash interest that's paid by the company to the investor. And the second piece is the accrued interest. So part of the interest is paid in cash, part of it is accrued and ultimately repaid in principal. That comprises the contractual return that the company owes to the debt investor. But on top of that, they get their sweetener and their upside from the equity exposure. So this could typically include warrants that are 3 to 10% of the exit value of the business. These significantly enhance the internal rate of return of the debt investor. The best way to thoroughly understand these returns is to model them out in Excel in the full capital structure. So once again, I would please refer you to our financial modeling courses that will go through this in much more detail in Excel. Thanks for watching this course on YouTube. To finish watching the full course, visit our site corporatefinanceinstitute.com where you can enroll for free to take the full Introduction to Corporate Finance course and earn your certificate. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at our next course.